Welcome to the heart of Esports Weekly, the round table where we bring on the biggest names and personalities from esports to talk about issues that actually matter to the scene. And today we're very proud to have on two awesome people. We have Evil Geniuses Dota 2 manager Charlie Yang. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Charlie. Well, thanks for having me. I'm going to make a Dota team with Snoopy. Oh, <laughs> that's beautiful. And of course, we have former pro gamer Snoopy with us as well. How are you doing, man? Well, now that you're announcing your part yeah, of this well, Dota team. I thought we were going to do Counter Strike. I wanted to Counter Strike. Oh, that's strike. right. That's right. That's right. That's <laughs> right. We're going to do Counter Strike. Counter -Strike. Yeah. Yeah, just do, skip, skip all of that. Just go straight to Rocket League. It's fine. Rocket uh, League. Charlie's <laughs> obviously one track mind. So, what are we here to talk about tonight, guys? Well, of course, uh, we want to discuss tournament stability within the esports scene. Now, of course, there are many different games, many different structures that are out there right now. LCS has a very conventional sports league style double mm. relegation system, two tiers in their leagues. Uh, they can introduce new blood through their challenger series. It all kind of culminates in a big playoffs at the end of the year in the form of Worlds. Um, Valve up to this point has been very different with the way they've approached their games. They're starting to introduce a series of majors to go along with like big marquee blowout events during the year. Blizzard kind of has games around the clock and players yep. just uh, accumulate points so they can get themselves to BlizzCon. And, so Yeah, then there's even still the fighting games who still do all of their events all over the world and also to the new upstarts like the aforementioned Rocket League. Right, and so the question that I have at first is, what infrastructure do leagues really need to kind of build up support and allow teams to flourish and kind of have a little bit of stability? Well, and, go ahead, Charlie. yeah, well, um, I think I, I think it's uh, it has a lot to do with balance. Mm. Um, what you've seen so far are throughout like the various the various titles you've seen a lot of variety you've seen a lot of different approaches to to sort of see what works for different scenes i think um there are really good things about uh the way certain certain structures work out like the lcs mm. um and there are advantages to other structures um like how csgo or dota is developed mm -hmm. i think if i was going to say it would, it, it's basically as you said stability like how can we create stability um, and I think that stability and consistency is one of the most important things. Doing, looking at one example, which is Dota doing one event at the end of the year, I don't think is great for the scene. Um, I think it puts on a great spectacle towards the end of the year, but it needs to be more consistent if you're going to ask players to choose this as a career path. Um, and then also from a broadcasting point of view, and spectator mm -hmm. point of view, I think it makes more sense to be spread out throughout the year. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that Valve has realized that as well, to some degree. They've obviously just recently introduced a series of majors, and these are huge events worldwide. I mean, their, their base prize pools rival that of the international. They're actually bigger in a lot of circumstances. Um, so do you think that trend's going to continue? I mean, especially to you, Charlie. Like, were we going to see more of these official, like, Valve-sponsored tournaments? I think I think you'll probably see them sticking with this structure for a while, these three majors plus the international. And I, I do agree with what Steven then said, that um, one event at the end, one massive event at the end of the year can be very destabilizing. This is something that a lot of the professionals within the scene had, had been had talked about and had been con a concern for them for a while. You spend your entire year working up for this one tournament and if you don't make it, well then you're, you're, you're kind of out of luck or, or if you do poorly at it, it's, it's your, your entire year is sort of just goes to nothing and you have really nothing to show for it. Yeah, and it's also just not just Dota here because they also have other games, believe it or not. You know, I still know that some people in the Counter-Strike scene are like, where's our international? Or even uh, some of their other some other stuff like Team Fortress it still has a huge underground scene, which some people may feel has been uh, lacking in support. So, do you think that maybe there's something to be gained by them going off and doing other things? I think they be careful, like don't bite off more than they can chew. Mm. It'd be hard for Valve's a very small company, a very nimble and agile company. Sure, they have a lot of money, but at the same time, if they want to keep the same level of production and same level of intimacy that they've done so far with Dota. Spreading that into doing it for TF2, doing yeah. that for Counter Strike as well. I think you should try to implement the first structure, which is going to be Dota. And they're actually right, right. they're doing some CS majors with partners mm -hmm. as yeah, well yeah. throughout the year. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a great like step towards a, a system they're trying to identify as better than the current one. Yeah. So I, I think that we're kind of dancing around a point here, which is that prize pool may not necessarily guarantee stability in a scene. Obviously, the international it just dwarfs every other prize pool that's out there. Um, I mean, you guys took on what, $6.6 .6 million for taking first or something like Just that? About. It's, it's a, a pretty big number to throw around, right? Yeah. yeah. It's a modest prize. Yeah, not no. bad, not bad, well done. <laughs> um, obviously, there's a lot lower price pool in LCS, but they guarantee player salaries. It's more of an right. organized uh, sports structure. So does price pool really have anything to do with stability at all? Um, I think it does. I mean, obviously, you don't want to be playing for something very small, um, but I think um, there's there's a given and take with, uh, with, I guess, the bulk of your money being in it. In a large prize pool at the end of the year, 
Um, one, it, it creates a lot of hype. It creates a lot of um, mainstream media attention. It's it's sort of like this this one off event to really draw a lot of attention in, and, and then in the subsequent year, you can really build off of that. On the flip side, if all your bulk is in that one year, and it, it, the scene becomes very top heavy, um, the the Dota two model it's it's still very much like this, even with the the major system, is that it's very bimodal. Um, as a Dota 2 pro, you either make a lot or you make very little. There's there's not a lot of in between. Um, so I do like what uh, what Riot's done with the LCS. Um, it's very consistent. They pay um, all their players a livable wage. There's um, uh, a way for you to uh, become a professional through the, the challenger scene. So um, it is very stable. Uh, I do think there are drawbacks with that, though. Um, I think the way that... Uh, LCS is structured, makes it very difficult to, I guess, um, if you're a team owner it's and if you're a bad team owner, it's also very hard to lose your spot. It mm -hmm. it, you can entrench bad team owners. Um, mm -hmm. And I think uh, we've seen that in certain cases. Well, I mean, Snoopy, I mean, you, you have experience playing, you know, pre-LCS days and yep. then into LCS days as well. Have you kind of seen that, that, you know, sometimes teams can get stuck at the top and there's not enough churn? I mean, uh, or is that of that stability inherently better for team ownership in general. So part of me um, really missed the opportunity to travel a lot, which I mean Dota and CS has. I mean, mm -hmm. if, I, if I'm a, a, a young kid and I'm getting the opportunity to play video games for a living, that's awesome, right? But I was also getting the opportunity to travel the world. I, I mean, I've lived in Korea, China, Ger like Europe, the US. Mm -hmm. And in the, cu the current structure, you don't really get that opportunity, um, at least not the entire league. There's only the top three that would get the opportunity to travel. So some part of me misses that. But I think in general, as, as Charlie was touching on, the good thing about League of Legends is that you get the opportunity, even if you're not the very best, you can make a living, you can justify saying, I want to be a professional gamer. Um, because at the Dota, if you're not the very best, that's a really huge commitment to say, I'm not going to go to school and I'm going to play video games for a living, but I'm only going to make, well, I mean, I don't know how much the Dota salaries are, but a, a lower tier salary is going to make like, minimum wage. Yeah, like $15,000 a year. Like, you cannot justify that. Uh, as a kid when you're making that decision. And I think that's what structure and stability in something closer to the right structure really enables. It allows mm -hmm. kids to make that dis conscious decision saying, I want to be a professional gamer, I can justify taking a couple of years at university because there's a legitimate stable career path here if I go down this route. Yeah, I think a lot of people are also now starting to realize it as well, you know, because there's a spectacle around the event and traveling and everything else associated with it. Uh, I still remember uh, back in the early days of professional Magic Gathering, you know, not, it wasn't necessary that travel was included. It's like, hey, cool, I won this qualifier to go to this event. Can I get there? Not really. The prize money I've won so far can't really get me there. Mm -hmm. And even then, too, we go back to prize pools for a little bit. You know, there's the big promotional aspect as well. There's the big fanfare around everything. The first international, you know, million dollar prize pool. Even uh, WCG did that with uh, mobile games too. It was also kind of strange oh, considering yeah. that you know asphalt well, yeah, would have a that. bigger prize pool than starcraft that, yeah. Yeah. but you know there is that aspect of it too it's like you know, not necessarily about the prize pools like oh man you know i get to go to like korea or china and do something else alongside what I like to do. But it seems like, you know, from what you're saying, Stephen, like, the, even though you didn't have those opportunities to travel, you appreciated the stability. But I guess that begs the further question. We seem to think that Riot system is more stable, but is it good? Is that ultimately what we need, that sort of a structure for all games? Does that universally apply? Or is there something, maybe some other uh, mix out there that's actually better for the scene? So, I, I mean, I would touch on, like Charlie, you said that um, incompetent owners can still be a part of the professional scene. I think we're actually transitioning away from that. I think there's more and more competent owners. It's just a process of elimination. Sure, sure. And gradually over the past two years or even year, um, some of the more less competent owners are being weaseled out of the no, industry. No, I, I, I agree. Uh, and I think the, so the promotion relegation system is quite good in that sense, but I wonder actually if we'll transition out of that. I think maybe going into next year or the year after, we might see franchising, uh, mm -hmm. which could be very, very interesting if there was actually franchise in the leagues where you only had these top 10 teams that were in the league. And these it was very well-financed, well-run organizations. Um, and there wasn't the opportunity for the challenger circuit to get in. That, I mean, that might happen. I'm, I'm curious if it would. Yeah, you yeah. know, and I think that begs a bigger question as well because there is a lot of money that's coming into the scene now. We've seen things propped up like Turner is starting to get into broadcasting CSGO. It was a big announcement that just came out recently. Um, and much of the, many of the bigger organizations are shooting for that kind of stability. So they take bets on proven organizations, organizations that have maybe multiple teams. They've been in the scene for a while. They've proved that they can be solvent even independent of maybe the money that the actual leagues are handing them. So um, I, I guess the question there is, 
um, what exactly would you do in order to to get new blood into a scene when advertisers are going after these big established franchises then? Or they're looking to keep those big franchises there so that way they can ensure that advertiser dollars will be there, etc. I think mean, this is a this is a pretty difficult question. So you're asking how do you get I guess um, Yeah. Yeah, we, we have like, organizations like Turner that are actually like taking bets on they're making sure that they have these big name teams that are in. It's very right. difficult to try so and get new blood. So how do you get blood. new brands, new Yeah, teams. how do you get new blood into this scene? I think, uh, I mean, it, it really just requires um, a system that promotes it. Uh, I guess with, with LCS you have, uh, you have the, uh, the challenger up and down system. Mm -hmm. um, and then with, with sort of Dota, Counter-Strike, uh, games that don't have a, a rigid structure, it's and it's a little more free flowing. You have it's it's a lot easier. The barriers to entry are much lower. You can just um, grab five players that happen to be really good. Maybe you make a miraculous run, um, and you grab some attention and you go that way. You've you've seen seen that in the last uh, last few years. You've had brands come up in um, in other circuits and other games that don't have a a league system like. Archon came up, um, Tempo Storm. Uh, you yeah. can argue that uh, C Deck is a thing. Uh, Vega Squadron as well. These are these are teams that um, didn't have a lot of uh, funding or fanfare mm -hmm. or tradition behind them, and they they had five guys. They made a really good run at a tournament, and um, they're building momentum behind that. Yeah. So I, mean, I would maybe argue, though, that yes, I agree there is still the potential, but a lot of the teams you named were in games that were relatively new at the time. So like Hearthstone, you had, um, if we're talking about the Hearthstone Archon in Temple Storm and things like that, that's where they came from. It was a new scene. It was very easy to get noticed. And it seems like as time goes along and more money gets put into the scene, it's a little bit harder to oh, accomplish absolutely. that. Yeah, yeah. Abs absolutely. I mean, the barriers to entry are just going to get higher and higher as we go along. I, I think that's, that's just... The, going to be an inevitability mm -hmm. of, of this space. Yeah, and it's really a big crime of opportunity too when games are up and coming because the expected lifespan of a brand new game, like when Hearthstone first broke out, you know, everyone's talking about it on Twitter and Facebook and people see that as an opportunity for investment, but it goes down sharply and quickly. And even now you try to post a thread or something on Reddit and if it does get any traction, if there's something very popular out there, it doesn't stay at the top for very long. So you need to act quickly mm -hmm. in order to get the full money, to get the full return on this. Mm -hmm. uh, to touch on that, Kevin, you're saying if we were to move to a franchise system uh, and we did away with the, like, the Challenger series, essentially what would happen, um, I think it would be very much more attractive for non-endemic brands to come into this space because there is consistency. They, they know that if they sponsor this team for three years, this team is going to actually be in the league for three years. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's a, if, I, if I'm a, a Coca-Cola or if I'm a, a bigger, another bigger brand, like whether it's like AT&T or one of these big brands, if I was going to sponsor Evil Geniuses, um, League of Legends team, if they had one, uh, if I was going to sponsor them, I don't know if they're going to be in the, for, six months later or four months later. So why would I do like a three-year-long deal with them and I might not actually have them in the game I want them to be in? Yeah, so I think that level of consistency is really good for the, like, the non-endemic brands that are looking at this space, and we may want that kind of system. Yeah. And, and I think that's a fair point, especially because, you know, other sports, you have those marquee franchises yeah. and they feed into the, their new blood through their own organization. Yeah. So baseball teams have minor league systems. You have the NBA Development League across the world. You have players that come from these other minor leagues and stuff the like collegiate that. Collegiate scene as well. As exactly. Yeah. Right. So there are potentials to, to move in with new blood there. Um, so I think that that's certainly very important. But... Now, this probably begs a larger question, though, which is once players are being forced through these franchises, through these marquee organizations that have proven themselves to be stable, there's not going to be much of a voice for the player, and it's mostly going to be there for the team. And in fact, this week, we had Navi CEO just distribute a, uh, a message on behalf of 10 major esports teams mm -hmm. saying that, hey, we have some demands for tournaments. We want to try and organize. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit and just player organization in general. Does that become more important under that franchise system that you're, that you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, I think it comes incredibly important. I think it's already important that players find a way to collectively bargain in a sense. Not necessarily unionized, I don't think we're quite ready for like full unionization and even the the thing that Navi Zoder came out with with the, the 10 teams, I don't think that's necessarily a union, it's more, it's almost like a business partnership in a sense mm -hmm. um, where they, they're advocating on certain things. And what was really funny about that is they're doing things for the players apparently, I mean they're setting all these uh, rules and procedures for players mm -hmm. 
but never consulted any of the players. Apparently, they yeah. maybe spoke to a few, but not like they, the amount of people that impacted. And, and we did reach out to Alex from Navi, and he did make it very clear that, like you said, this is an unofficial, this isn't like a true union, this yeah. is just a yeah. partnership, and they are advocating on behalf of players, but you're right. A lot of players uh, were not contacted about yeah. this, which, which you know, really asks, is this the team ownership interests that are at heart here, or is this really what's best for players? I think this is yeah. absolutely the team ownership's interests at heart. Um, if you look at the, the list of the demands, it's a lot of it has to do with cutting costs uh, on their side. Um, and then there, there's the argument to be made, though, that if you cut costs on the team side, some of that trickles down to the player side. But I think that's um, honestly a little naive. Very I th- naive. Mm-hmm. I, I think um, the I, I think once that happens, let's say let's say uh, team owners they cut costs on their side. Um, tournaments pay for travel. Tournaments pay for this or or, or whatever. Um, and the the teams have more money to play around with. And the, a player will will go to your owner and say, "Can you pay me more? You have more money now." That and the team owner might say, "Just come back and say, just because I have more money doesn't mean make you worth more money." So there's there's no guarantee that trickles down. There's no guarantee that um, the players see any of that benefit. There's no guarantee that um, any of their interests are really represented here. Yeah. Okay. Yep. It's right. also it's also not just the players too, because there's also a ring of people below the players as well. You, know, you still have people who are working for social media marketing, people who are just doing things like just to organize them like within team houses and things like that. There are other employees involved. And if we have players you know, not getting most of what trickles down, what's gonna trickle down to them too? They just may get nothing. For sure. All right, and welcome back to the extended cut here for our round table of Esports Weekly. We are once again joined by Evil Geniuses Charlie and Snoopy, and uh, we were just talking or getting to start talking about the concept of players' unions. Obviously, yeah. got me all railed up. I know. <laughs> that's right, but to throw it back for everyone, we had briefly mentioned that there was uh, an unofficial business partnership between yeah. team owners that had advocated on behalf of their organizations for certain demands in the scene. They wanted standards for prize pools. They wanted standards for travel. Of games played per day, Toilet things breaks. like that. Yes, exactly. Um, the important stuff. And uh, but that begs the bigger question of player unions in general. And what sort of voice do players actually have to collectively organize today? Especially since esports organizations are becoming much more valuable. There's a lot of money at stake here. Yeah, I mean, touching on the money that's coming into the scene, we're seeing a lot more non-endemics get involved in the space, um, and a lot of that money. And the representation as well. You see, like agencies like WME or IMG coming into the space, and they're representing the teams, which obviously brings in more money when they bring on these big sponsorships. And then the premise is that when this money comes in at the top, it should all filter down to the players. But there's no transparency surrounding that. How does the player know how much money is coming in? How much of that pie they're actually getting? Are they getting a noticeable increase? Um, what's what we traditionally see right now is they get this money. These organizations pull in more money, and then that will then go to go into another game. So we'll pick up a CS team now. We'll go pick up a Dota team. So even though it may have been the CS team or the League of Legends team that built this brand and really elevated it and some of the key players um, may have been involved in getting the non-endemics involved, they'll just go and reinvest in another team and they'll just yeah. spread out the business. I mean, it's good business sense, but it's not good for those particular players that increase the value of the brand hit like very, very significantly. Yeah, it's also too like LCS is now being seen as you know, the it's almost like kickstarting. It's almost like kickstarting a team, you know, because I've talked with a bunch of prospective team owners. Like, cool. So, what's your what's your business plan? It's like, well, our first step is to get an LCS. It's like, okay, cool. So, uh, what do you do if you don't get an LCS? And there's nothing, you know, because it seems like that's the reliable. Right, money. but I mean, I think like we were talking about before with the more yeah. franchises that are coming up, that something like that is going to get harder and harder yeah. as you have more entrenched teams. So then let's talk solutions then. What are options for players to collectively organize and bargain? What recourse do they have with the current esports market as it is? Well, I think it starts, well, I, I, I think we should be clear that um, I think if players unionize or if players get together and collectively bargain, I think it should be re- respective to, to each game. Mm-hmm. I don't think... Um, a union really works across all players for all games together. I think you need to have a Dota union, you need to have a CSGO union, you need to have a League of Legends union. Um, because I think the, the scenes are so different, I think um, interests are going to vary too much. And um, I already know, like, even, even, even within, play, even for, for players within, uh, within a scene, within one game, interests can vary wildly. Mm-hmm. Uh, between region to, to region, between player to player. I think um, 
so I think uh, it should start with that. And I think um, in terms of how players get together, um, I think figureheads are very important here. Uh, yeah. People that they trust, people that have been in the scene for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I think it really takes somebody that's, that's passionate about it, that's um, um, a little selfless, maybe a lot, probably a lot selfless, selfless. To, to, yeah. to really yeah. go out and start it themselves. Because right now, a lot of the, the current professional players, they're busy playing, they're busy with their own interests, they're busy getting better, and they're not going to devote a lot of time to, mm -hmm. you know, forming a union, to, to getting players together to really think about these kind of things. Well, yeah. Steven, you've been very active on this. This is something you were very outspoken about, even as a player and things yeah. like that. So, I mean, from your perspective, um, how do you accomplish that? How does someone become that figure? your head, what, what steps can they take to actually start moving this forward for players? So I, I echo Charlie's thoughts. It's not going to take someone like a team owner or a, a journalist or whatever. It has to be a former player mm. that basically takes this role. A current player can't do it. It's far too large a responsibility. Uh, the, a current player could help facilitate the conversation and getting people together, but it's going to take someone on the outside that's not got all these different responsibilities. They're going to really have to focus on this. But creating a union, is it's not an easy process. Like There's the whole part we have to like register as a whatever the registration process right. is, then you have to get the financing. Who's going to finance it? Is it going to be some altruistic billionaire that comes into this space and just loves esports? Is it going to be a company like Twitch? Or is it going to be a company like Azubu? Or is it going to be the teams that then say, look, we love the players so much, we really believe they're a really important part of this ecosystem and they need representation. We're the ones making a lot of money right now. Perhaps we should fund it. Would teams do that? Probably not. But someone's going to have to front that bill, right? Yeah. Uh, and who's going to do it? I don't know. I don't think we're going to see us transition straight into a union. I think there'll be baby steps towards that, where there'll be some collective bargaining. But I think there's a huge education process that has to happen for players at a whole um, that's not necessarily happened yet. And that's going to be individual representation. So I think player agents are going to be the first step in a like, kind of long process to get players to come around. So you're going to have, like right now, if you went and asked a player, do they get a lawyer to vet their contract? I'm going to tell you maybe like 10%, and that's being generous, 10% of players in the current esports ecosystem get a lawyer to look at their contract before signing on it. And that could be a two year long contract. So that's, we're going to have to get agents first who suggest get lawyers, get accountants. So the agents are going to have to come in first. Players already don't see value in agents. This is an issue, this is a bigger issue. Agents have to prove that value first. Um, and once they do, I think gradually more and more players are going to get agents. We just need higher quality agents mm -hmm. looking out for the players. You know, and I, I agree with what you're saying about franchises from before as well, given what Charlie said as well about the scene being so decentralized. And we do have to kind of take a per game approach simply due to the fact that, well, there hasn't been a game that's been proven to last for more than a few years yet, right? I mean, we are in a state where we're still a very Wild West young industry. And I think that the decentralization of esports and the fact that you don't have a game that's been stable for 15 years that people can build a business on especially complicates things as well. Right, yeah, Brood War uh, hit about you know, a decade in its, in its heyday. League of Legends is now in the fifth season. But you know, everyone looks at something like StarCraft II. We thought StarCraft II was going to go on just as long as Brood War, and it's not—it's not doing so hot right now. You know, hate to say. Yeah, unfortunately, no. So, I mean, I mean, so does that destabilization, that decentralization, I guess, of games play into this as well? Uh, when, especially when you're looking at sponsors, or does that just strengthen the franchises because they're really the only measure of stability? The teams themselves. I think it, it definitely strengthens franchises, but I think um, the way we're headed now is a. Uh, it's, it's a little different than where we were before. While these games might not last um, 10, 15 years, I think what you'll see is that the quali quality of people within these games might transition to the, into other games. Mm. Um, and you'll build a base there. Like, um, let's say a manager in one game or an agent in one, that represents players in one game, um, if that game dies out, uh, they might transition to another, and they'll and if they if they did a good job, they'll have that reputation from that game, and they'll and that's how the the scene will continue to grow. Bono's Dota Two. <laughs> <laughs> if you are old enough to get that reference, please tweet at us. <laughs> <laughs> just just to touch on the the player representation and why I think it's so important this education process. The problem is the larger agency is the one with a lot more experience, right? Mm -hmm. They, if it was say it was a WME or an IMG, it was to say I'll take a fifteen percent cut of a player's salary. For one agent to do that they would have to represent 10 to 12 players just to break even, mm -hmm. right? And their businesses at the end of the day, they're big businesses that deal with far larger sums of money right now than a player's salary. So that's one of the issues as well. Like, who's, where are you gonna get a quality agent that wants to represent a player when they're only gonna make 
anywhere between five to twenty grand per player. Um, it's not not necessarily an attractive business model. Uh, yeah. So it really takes some a lot of altruism from some significant players in this industry if they want to like take it to the next step. Uh, and I think uh, who's that who's that going to fall on? I don't necessarily know, um, but someone's going to have to take that to yeah. And, and, the scene. and in a way that can also be self defeating as well because you have an agent here who's not seeing their return, but also you see a player here who's also seeing what's in front of them and saying, you're like, you know what, I could probably do this myself. And we've seen that a few times, and it's not always the case. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure. And we can pull this back to tournament structures as well and kind of go back to our original subject. Tournaments themselves have such a wide variety of formats that are out there. Mm -hmm. They're probably contributing a bit to this instability as well. And is there anything that either developers, developers themselves as first party should be doing for their game, or these third party organizations that are running tournaments to actually help out this player situation? Well, maybe first off, you know, we've seen a lot of organizations also not pay that's a big issue, and you know, thankfully, over time now, as we become you know, less of the Wild West, money is actually being paid out. So that's mm -hmm. step one, which I think we're already off to a good start. Yeah, definitely. Sure. So I, I think beyond the basic things like you know, paying your prize pool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the basics. Um, I think it's it, it's really hard to say what should developers be doing, what should um, tournaments be doing. I think we're we're in such a new space right now. Everybody's just trying their own thing. I, I don't even think there's I could really point to a right answer right now in terms mm -hmm. of how we should be structured or how each game should be structured. I think we're sort of just iterating as we go along, trying to find the best steps. Um, I think it would be disingenuous of me to say that I had an answer or that anybody really has an answer right now. I will say I, I don't have an answer, but I have a proposition, which mm -hmm. may be sure, a good sure. in between. Uh, I think. I think essentially we need some form of governing body yeah. um, on the entire industry. Mm -hmm. Someone who is like an independent adjudicator that helps all of these parties come together. So I want, the, I want all the tournaments speaking to all the tournaments. I want, all, I want the tournaments then speaking with all the, the developers. I want, then I want the players speaking together and I want all the players speaking uh, to the tournaments and basically having some form of representation from each party and having them all talk together. So who ultimately, though, has the authority to pull something like that together in such like a decentralized scene as we've been talking about, especially given what you were saying you know, uh, just a second ago, Charlie? Right now, nobody. No, yeah. So no one has the authority, no uh -huh. but every single one of us, we've seen people in this industry for 10, 20 years, right? It takes those people that are still in a position of power, so it takes your, your Navi owners, mm -hmm. it takes your your Twitch, um, the, the people at Twitch, it takes your people at Riot, it takes your people at Blizzard, it takes them all to say, like, we love this industry and we want it to grow, so we have to work together. It just takes all of them yeah. to have that kind of realization and uh, to step back and say, look, if I really want to further this industry, we just have to collaborate. Mm -hmm. I, I, I totally agree. I think that um, something like that, if we could achieve the ideal f version of that, that would be great. That would be, um, it would push us uh, forward a lot, but I, I just I, I don't see that happening. Yeah, well, well, no, I mean, it, like you, you talked about it, like it requires people from Twitch, people from ESL, the the, the Navi owners, the, yep. the team owners, everybody to sort of come together and be very selfless with their with their intentions. And I think, um, like to to speak to the sort of darker, seedier side of yeah, esports, you're, yeah. you're, you're 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 not going to see that. Oh, so with with of, with, so with the, if, if I mean if, if you yeah. look at it, I know you've seen it. Yep. Um, like the, the the way things develop, the the ways the way things develop in this scene, right? Are 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 done with the intention of I'm going to grow my own business. I'm yeah, going but, to but, but that, grow my own bottom line. That's inherently the I, problem, though, right? Because yeah, right. like as you were saying before, we are iterating, and like right. that's kind of the method, right? And we're figuring things out as we go along, and I think that's fine. Except for the fact that we now have close to a billion dollars a year that's going to be poured into the scene very soon. And when you have that kind of money going around, yeah, you've got to think yeah. that. Yeah, I, 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 I think, think, you, I think you do. Yeah. You, you do have to think that, that yeah. way. But I think it's a very select few people that think that way and not enough. That's right? fine. Yeah. That's fine. That, those, I, people, those people just have to act right. on that. I, right. they've, they've they also start, they start, they start, I, I agree. They have to be the right people in the right positions. I think... Um, yeah. I mean... I. I yeah, I so, think we yeah. would all love that, but okay, I think Okay, yeah, we'd all love it, so I'll give another proposition, right? <laughs> okay. So I'm just firing out the propositions. Go for it. I like just, it, I just, love it. Just, so just go for it. If we can't get them all to work together, let's just get them all talking. So there's mm. events oh, that this, happen. Oh, this has happened before. That's my point. It has. This has I know it has happened times before. before. But just look at small events, right? Like, e like the industry is obviously revolutionizing and changing, right? The more occurrences where we get 
a, a large amount of the authority or people of power within esports together. Esports conference was a great example of that. Mm. Um, Atlanta, when they were all out there for Turner and speaking about that, mm -hmm. great opportunity to talk about the future of the industry. Having more situations like that where they're talking, a lot of like a lot of good comes out of that. But what will ever sure. be the impetus? to force them to do that, though? Is it just the money is gonna to get too big, they have to start talking at some point? Yeah. I mean, what takes Honestly, someone yes. out of their own interest of their Honestly, own organization? Yes, then, collectively, they can, like, if the pie is getting bigger, right, mm -hmm. they obviously have to work out how they're gonna get part of that pie. And you can see organizations like Cloud9 and TSM obviously developed a very strong relationship. Uh, and Team Liquid as well is kind of part of that. Mm -hmm. And they, when they go out and reach the sponsors, like HTC, for example, they're doing collective deals. And that's them collaborating, right? It's it's kind of I'm a little bit apprehensive to say that's the ultimate solution because then you're kind of alienating uh, alienating some other people. But that's a start. Is like where they're starting to work together and pitch themselves and collaborate in terms of furthering the scene, bringing more non-endemics in. It's, it's yeah. part of the solution, but it's not definitely not anywhere near the yeah. solution. So I think like forcing or somehow waiting for an opportunity to where this is no longer avoidable. You know, we're kind of waiting for the doomsday situation. Like, the meteor is about to crash into Earth. Like, now it's finally time. Let's get everybody together. And right now in the current scene and everything, I mean, we have a lot of overlapping events. It's actually one of our major, major issues when, back when uh, IPL was in its heyday. But when you look at the audiences of a whole bunch of games, you know, not necessarily someone who watches LOL will want to watch Counter-Strike. So maybe when we get those events, when events are so frequent now where games are now overlapping each other mm -hmm. is maybe when we have to force this. It's it's it's. I think it's more about the money at the end of the day, less the tournament structure or anything. It's the money mm -hmm. that's going to talk it, honestly. Yeah. Um. So we we see and even expertise. Traditional sports is starting to come into the space. Like we saw ESPN, we're seeing Turner uh, Broadcasting, we're seeing a lot of like sports personalities, and then even t team owners in the NBA are starting to invest in esports. Yeah. As they come in, if we don't, as people that love this industry and really passionate about this industry, get together and try and shape the death of the future of this, this space, they're going to come in, they're going to do it for us. Yeah. And they're going to take ownership over the, what esports is going to look like in the next 10, 15 years. And I think it's on ourselves to realize that, that this, all this money is coming in. If we want to shape the industry that we love, then we're going to have to start acting a little bit selflessly and work together. And maybe, maybe that takes a flick five people that sure, think this sure, way to sure. actually start transcending. Sure. Yeah. My, my, my point is that um, it, it's always going to be uh, an us versus them mentality when, like, in this space, and it always has been. Yeah. Um, whether that us is um, players together and team owners being the them, or, uh, or all of us being the us and non-endemics like um, and much rather and, 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 that and, and much rather than the yeah. yeah. <laughs> either way there's always going to be a sort of us versus them in this space and I think for for everybody to sort of collectively come and make a, a governing body um, so I'd love it but but, but see, really it's the eternal pessimist in you that's going to prevent change. <laughs> but, yeah, but let's let's talk about what it would actually take to bring people to the table and actually get people to start discussing that stuff. I would assume that on some level there has to be a financial case made for if you collaborate and work together and establish this sort of an organizing body, you can actually collectively grow the scene more. Do you think that an organizational uh, an organizational structure like that actually helps and benefits and can create better investment for the scene overall? Yes, I mean without a doubt. Yes, yes mm -hmm. absolutely. But it, it's going to take. Um, two years of slowed growth and take everything else. Probably, maybe yeah. more than that yeah. because pe people, in order for people to come together and form an organizing body, these people are also going to have to give up pieces of their own power. Yeah, um, They're going to have to give up certain parts of their own sphere of influence and they're going to have to submit themselves to this governing body. And yeah, yeah, but I mean, to be fair, I mean, I remember three years ago the same arguments were being made. You know, eventually we'll figure this out. There's more money coming into the scene. Eventually, players will get a greater share of voice. And we've seen small steps from, steps from individual organizations to help that. Riot provides player salaries. Sure. Now we do have some stability just because there's so much money being thrown in that it's a little bit easier to pay players than it used to be four or five years ago. But that's the same thing I heard a couple years ago, you know? Yeah. That eventually that's where we have to go. But when is the money enough that it's eventually going to start hurting the players? Now we're yeah. talking about a yeah. billion dollars a year. A few years from now it could be billions and billions. And uh, at what point do we actually start needing that? Yeah. Or even will we ever hit that point? Mm -hmm. Will what? we ever get to the point where a, a team manager is like, he's like, you know what, no, I have enough to go in and share with my players. Like, or No, it's going to be the players. No, it's going to be the players. The players are going to be the ones demanding. 
everything. Look at traditional sports as like as equity, yeah. right? All we and that's the great thing about esports, right? We're like a very young mm -hmm. industry. We can say we're twenty years old, but we're really only I'd say like ten, sure. fifteen years old. Um, and even more, the, the evolution of esports in the last five years has been a lot different. Uh, and we look at traditional sports that have been shaped over sixty to hundred years. Mm -hmm. We have all of that to look at and learn from, and we're really not doing it. Yeah. Uh, so we can just look at all these examples of where player associations <laughs> formed and like what the how that evolved and the things we can learn. But do you yeah. think there are any unique challenges though versus traditional sports and being able to get that done? Or are the parallels there and we just need to learn the lessons and go? Well, oh, there are absolutely unique yeah. challenges. When, when, you, when you look at the average career for someone in traditional sports, you know, it can go, it's, it's multi-year. You know, someone like in football, maybe they're for like two, three years, baseball, five, six. When you look at someone who's just getting esports as a player, it's a very short time. Yeah, my, but, yeah. my career as a player, didn't even hit half a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but and how how can someone you know how can I have any bargaining power in that uh, in that position? That's a larger conversation though, because the, yeah. the player shelf life right now, which is probably on average about three years, mm -hmm. um, if I was going to say like broadly across the scenes, yeah, uh, that's just the start. Like players players could play for seven years or six yeah, or eight I, years, right? There's no reason why they can't. Mm. It's, a large part is just the the infrastructure and support and like stability within the scene basically dictates that they can only have a three-year shelf life. There's no reason, in the way in which they train and everything, it's all like completely ineffective, right? As, as we start to grow up as an industry, the shelf life of a player is gonna increase dramatically. It's gonna be at least I, six years, I, I guarantee agree. it. Um, For sure. Right, so and also to that effect, you know, how many players in LCS now have been there for three plus years? I mean, now we have so many more people coming in from Challenger up and through, you know, more people are actually starting to cycle out as well. You know, people are being replaced on teams, people are being benched, or people are also moving over to coach roles or yeah. management roles where they're not as active anymore. Maybe their overall value could be dropping. Yeah, but then I'll, I'll also come back to support and infrastructure. Like, yeah, yeah. sure, League has a great uh, stability and it's consistent, right? But the infrastructure and support around these players mm. is still very, very ineffective. Their training, the way in which they train is really ineffective. And I think as we see traditional sports, uh, like coaches and personality and experience coming into this space. And there's not a direct, like you can't emulate it directly, but there's things you can learn. And we start instilling that in the practice environment of teams. I think it's gonna gradually increase the shelf life of these players. Uh, and it's, it's all about money as well. Like a lot more money comes in, I think, gradually player sh shelf life will increase. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we see that even, uh, just to draw the example from last weekend at Worlds, we saw a couple of veteran players from the West, XPK and uh, um, High really step up and show that veterans are still viable in the scene, that they've been yeah, there I mean, for I a while think, and things like that. I think like Lemonation is like 37 or whatever he is now. I don't know. He's, <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, so. I think he's probably 24, but it's, you know what I mean. Okay, so let's talk a couple of more things. Let's bring it back to tournaments for a second and start to talk about things that are unrelated to, to the direct stability of, of supporting players. Let's Let's talk about what tournaments can start doing to support the fan base. Um, now we have bigger tournaments than ever. They're occupying arenas now. Um, what though can tournament organizers actually do to start improving the spectating experience, to start improving the quality of life for fans as well? Um, so I think big arenas are kind of bad, in all honesty. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the advantages we have is the level of intimacy that we can provide at esports events. Um, I think it's something that esports has over any traditional sport is that there's a really intimate connection between uh, the teams and the players and the fans. And I think we lose that when we try to do like 40,000 people events. The, when I went to the Sangnam World Cup, the League of Legends Season 4 Championships mm -hmm. in Korea, um, it was awesome, it was a really big spectacle and I was like happy we could fill a stadium with 40,000 people, but it was chaotic, it was nowhere near as intimate. I much preferred Staples Center. Mm -hmm. um, it was far more intimate in general. And I'm glad that the venues they've chosen this year are a little bit smaller and they can really create that intimate connection. That's why I like the International, for example. I think you guys have gotten bigger like over the we have, years. And you didn't we like have. that, right? You guys right. Like it. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's really a give and a take. Um, the, uh, the bigger venues are easier to sell into, easier to grow the scene, but at the mm -hmm. same time, you do lose that connection. A lot of people have said this about the transition between uh, Benaroya Hall and Key Arena for the International. Benaroya Hall is a very intimate venue. Um, much less people. It's like a concert hall. It's uh, it's it's really great for the tournament. Uh, fans and players interact a lot more there. And then you go to Key Arena, and players are on an entirely different level. Sure. You need yeah. special access to get up there. They don't but have to ever go down there. The counterpoint to this, though, is if you want forty thousand people to show up to an event, what are you gonna? Why are you gonna tell them that they can't necessarily come to the event? Or why is that a? Why? How would you be able to convince them that that's a, a worse experience necessarily? Because right. I'll, I'll be honest, I don't think the the tournament organizers, and this extends to even Riot, who are mm -hmm. like I would say one of the the better tournament organizers, um, just because the amount of money they pump in, expertise they brought in house. 
Uh, I don't think they're capable of really managing it like a 40,000 person arena. I think they're really stretching themselves then to do that. Yeah. And unless they're going to outsource to people with like decades of experience in event management at that level, uh, then I think it's better if we're going to continue having the smaller venues. Yeah. Honestly. And when you have a game that's so huge, I mean, yeah, sure, a 40,000 person venue, when you market that to a group of people, you know, to play the biggest game on PC in the world, of course you're going to fill all the seats. There's no arena of reasonable size that can, you know, actually not sell out to something like that. So like, do you think there's a responsibility there to pick the correct venue and to pick the right setting and to tell people like, hey, you know, we need to even, even possibly have more events like we're seeing in Dota? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think there, there obviously is a responsibility to, to pick the right venue for your game, to pick mm -hmm. the right venue for your tournament. Um, just like there's a responsibility to put on a good event that all sort of mm -hmm. ties in together. Well, you know, I think this also uh, talks to a, a lot of what we went through a few years ago with esports, right? When everyone was asking the question, okay, Twitch is starting to get big now, online streaming is starting to get big, do we have to go to TV? And I think that's a lot of the question we're asking here, too. Do you ha does esports have to be in an arena necessarily in order for it to be successful? So I'll bring it back to the TV question then. We're now at the point, we'll bring up Turner again, They're, they are announcing the CSGO tournament on TV. Is that a good thing for the sport? Is is that what we is that what we want for esports moving forward, or should esports inherently live in this online space where it kind of grew? Yeah, and the first time around, well, first two times around, didn't exactly do too much. You know, yeah, Directv right. and also Sci-Fi didn't wasn't really the big push to get to TV. But mm -hmm. you know, I've heard the argument made a lot of times that you know TV is not really where esports is home. No, you know? it's not. I think what you're seeing right now from from all sorts of games is that. Esports doesn't have to do any one thing to be successful. You're seeing um, lots of different approaches in different games that, that are successful and that are getting better and that still have room to grow. But that you don't have to be on TV. You don't have to have big arenas to be successful. You can look at Smash right now. Mm -hmm. um, you can argue that it's gotten very successful from where it was however many years ago. And I'm pretty sure they have never been to an arena. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but... Um, it's, I think it's uh, really about finding what works for your audience mm. and, and just, then just to, growing it from there. To mm -hmm. touch on that, it's like it's, we, don't, we don't want TV, it's more TV wants us. We, we have a very attractive audience, a uh, very young, very engaged right. audience, and TV, like broadcasting, would absolutely love to get a piece of that, right? Mm. Yeah. But they, they also don't understand that these guys that are watching right now, they don't sit in their living rooms and watch. They that's sit right. at their computers and watch, uh, and that's, that's where they are. Like, kids have just kind of transitioned out of the living room and then into the, their bedroom. Um, and I think yeah. that's the trend that we're seeing in general entertainment anyway with more streaming platforms and things like that, but I find it curious that we're going to see this push back to TV because I agree with you. I don't think it necessarily has to be there. There is a different viewing pattern for, for yeah. esports. Yeah, and I think, I think they're not necessarily, I don't, I hope their pitch is not that they're trying to get the people that are in their bedrooms into their living rooms. Mm -hmm. I think the pitch is more, there's people out there that watch sports, there's people out there that may be interested or play games but don't really know that esports exists. And I think that's the audience they should be going after is educating them, the people that already sit and watch sports who may tune into a couple of games of Counter-Strike on TV. Uh, and I think it's going after them. They should try and convert the current esports viewer base, which is what, is it like 100 and, no, it's 90 million or something right now, mm -hmm. esports mm -hmm. enthusiasts. Um, it shouldn't try and convert those to sit in the living room and watch TV. Yeah, okay. and education was also a very big thing too for when uh, poker was just starting to... Uh, come into the scene as well is that you know, there's so you know, a lot of us you know, know how to play poker, but not about some of the finer nuances. And that could be said even too, like how some of the speed running, uh, uh, speed running events have also gotten so huge oh, yeah. on Twitch and everywhere on YouTube because you're also learning. You're taking something that you already know, something that's already familiar, and you're learning something new. Yeah, I also think though that internet, uh, internet viewing and streaming is just inherently the best platform because we're in a space where everyone craves the next big thing, the next big niche and everything like mm -hmm. that. You talk about people watching at their computers and not their living rooms. Most of the time they're watching with six streams up, they're probably playing a game at the same time and they're doing other activities. It's just a different viewing pattern from what you typically get from TV. All right, well, I think that wraps up our extended round table as well. So thank you very much to our panel once again, AJ, Charlie, Snoop Bay. Thank you so much, guys. And uh, we will catch you guys on the next Esports Weekly Roundtable. Have a good one.